He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's on this Easter Sunday. Um, announcements are not a lot. First one is that next Sunday, immediately following worship, we will have a congregational meeting for the purpose of electing one elder to fill an open sp uh, place on session. Um, also, since we enjoyed fellowship time before uh, our worship, there is no fellowship time following worship. Are there any other announcements for today? All right. Yes. Eva. 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 Yvonne. Yvonne. Wow. Could not get that out. Yes, they're lovely. And all of us struggling with major allergies don't have to worry because they are not, they are, um, they are beautiful but artificial. <laughs> I didn't want to use the, the F-A-K-E word. <laughs> yes, uh, my whole family is allergies going crazy. Um, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Please rise as you are able for the call to worship. This is the day when God shines the way out of pandemic's worry and grace offers bouquets of good news. This is the day the Lord sings songs of wonder to awaken us as life teaches us new dance steps. This is the day the Lord has made, the day when hope pushes aside the stone of our months of fear, when love takes our hand so we can walk together into life. Let us join together in singing hymn number 232, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. We don't have to tell you, but we need to remind ourselves of how actions, words, inattention cause harm to others. Yet this is the day, as on every day, when God calls us by name, filling us with grace and making us whole. Let us bring all we have done to God for mercy and hope. Let us pray together, saying, in our foolishness, we think this old story has nothing to do with us. God of imagination. And so we miss the incredible news that love has triumphed over death, goodness has defeated evil, that life has broken the power of death and the grave. Yet this is the day of joy, of wonder, of grace which never ends, God of every life, God of very life. 
So may we push aside the stone of indifference we have rolled across our hearts. So we may be reminded that this old story is new every moment, that those ancient promises still hold true, that we are the ones called by the gardener of grace, Jesus our brother, who calls us by name and anoints us with resurrection love. Amen. On that first day and the next and every day until now and beyond, God turns, calls us by name, planting mercy and life into our hearts. This is the good news. Christ is our peace, the peace we need, the peace which will fill the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Amen. Before the foundation of the world, Christ forgave us and forgives us still today. Let us forgive as we have been forgiven and share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. I feel like my children will forgive me if I don't do a children's moment that, uh, <laughs> that they've heard every year for 15, 16, however many years. Yeah. Yeah.
Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel according to John. Chapter 20. Before turning to scripture, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From the Gospel according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she went, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She she turned and said to him in, Ra- in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance, what did she do? She ran. Mary ran to Simon Peter and to John, the one referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. Then the two men ran back to the the tomb with John outrunning Peter. Don't think of the first Easter morning as a time of calm reflection and meditation. Instead, it was a morning of emotion, intensity, and action. Kind of like a marathon. Soon there will be action on the road between Hopkinton, Massachusetts, and Boston. The Boston Marathon is scheduled to be run involving tens of thousands of runners. But do you know what happened exactly 50 years ago today, on April 17, 1972? That was the day the Boston Marathon allowed women to compete for the very first time. Nina Kuksik emerged from the field to win the women's race, and all eight of the female runners completed the 26.2-mile course. The Boston Marathon didn't have a place for women for 75 years. They were underestimated, ignored, and shut out. 
One running coach actually believed the distance was too far, too much for what he called fragile women. But then Roberta Gibb became the first woman to run the full Boston Marathon in 1966. Now, she couldn't get an official race number, so she hid in the bushes and jumped into the race when it began. Then in 1967, Catherine Schweitzer registered as K.B. Schweitzer, not identifying herself as a woman. When she began to run, race officials tried to remove her from the marathon. One of them frightened her, grabbing her shoulders and trying to rip off her bib number. Her boyfriend shoved the man to the ground, and she finished the race in about four hours and 20 minutes. Only when the Amateur Athletics Union accepted women into long-distance running did Boston open the race to women. Now, women are running in Boston every single year, as well as in marathons around the world. It was on my bucket list that I did, what is that, six, seven years ago now? Whew, never do it again. Just as 1972 was a turning point for female marathoners, Easter morning was a moment of truth for the followers of Jesus. Until then, Mary Magdalene wasn't mentioned much in the Gospel of John. The only clear report is that there were three Marys standing near the cross of Jesus. His mother Mary and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. The name Mary was very common among Jewish women in that time, and John tells a number of stories about another Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. But suddenly, Mary Magdalene slips into this race, like Roberta Gibb popping out of the bushes or Catherine Schweitzer running as K.V. Schweitzer, Mary Magdalene makes a dramatic appearance. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary comes to the tomb. She's the first of the followers of Jesus to make that trip. She arrives before Simon Peter, before John, before any of the other men. Like a woman training for a marathon, she hits the road early. Run, Mary, run. What Mary sees is that the stone had been removed from the tomb. This discovery naturally upsets her, since she assumes that grave robbers have been at work. She runs to Simon Peter and to John and says to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Notice that she calls Jesus the Lord and she says to them that we do not know where they have laid him. By calling Jesus the Lord and using the plural we, She's identifying herself as a part of the community of Jesus' followers. Clearly, there were more than 12 disciples, and not all of them were men. Beth Moore is one of the most effective Bible teachers in the Christian community, especially among women. She has spoken at big-name evangelical churches, and her studies are everywhere. Anywhere you look, you can find Beth Moore. A leader of the Southern Baptist Convention has said that it would be hard to find a church where at least some segment of the congregation has not been through at least one Beth Moore study. But now, Moore has been transformed. The old way is over, she says. The stakes are too high. She is appalled by sexual misconduct in the worlds of politics and the church. She's adamant that Christian men should always treat women exactly as Jesus did, always with dignity, always with esteem, never as secondary citizens. Jesus himself treated Mary Magdalene with esteem and dignity, never as second class. And this seems to be the attitude of Peter and John as well. The two men take Mary very seriously and respond to her by running to the tomb themselves. They run together, but at one point, John pulls ahead and reaches the tomb before Peter. John peers in and sees the linen wrappings, but he, he doesn't go in. Peter arrives, 
enters the tomb and sees both the wrappings and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head. Strangely, the cloth is rolled up in a place by itself, says scripture. Now, that's a clue. It's a clue that maybe the disappearance of Jesus was not a robbery. What grave robber would take the time to roll up a cloth and carefully lay it aside? Then John enters the tomb, and the gospel says that he saw and believed. That's a curious phrase, isn't it? He le it leaves us to wonder exactly what it is that he saw and believed. Perhaps he saw that the tomb was empty, and he believed the truth of Mary's story. That may have been enough for him for that moment in time. He heard Mary's story and he believed. Each of us is challenged to believe that our fellow Christ, what our fellow Christian tells us. There are truths that we need to hear and there are insights and experiences that come to us from people who have been overlooked and ignored. We need to listen and believe when women like Beth Moore say, wake up sleepers to what women have dealt with all along in environments of gross entitlement and power. Wake up, listen, believe. To John's credit, he believed that Mary told what Mary told him. We should do the same throughout the Christian community. Now, it's probably true that John did not yet believe that Jesus had conquered death. The gospel tells us that he and Peter did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So at this point, it's enough to see the empty tomb and believe. Then Peter and John return to their homes. They are, run they are done running for now. But Mary, even though she is weeping, does not drop out of the marathon. Looking into the tomb, she sees two angels in white and tells them she's weeping because someone has taken away her Lord. A moment later, she turns, sees a man, and she assumes it's the gardener and says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, just tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. For Mary, Easter morning begins not with joy, but with weeping and struggle. If you are feeling the same way, don't lose heart. Just as Mary did, hang in there. She's hitting Heartbreak Hill at about mile 20 of the Boston Marathon. It's natural to struggle with doubt and uncertainty, especially when you are being challenged by something you have never encountered before. Then Jesus recognizes her. Mary, he says, she turns and she says, Rabboni, which means teacher. In the middle of her pain and struggle, Jesus sees her for who she is. The very same is true for you. Wherever you are on the marathon of your faith development, Jesus sees you and recognizes you. All you have to do is respond. Say yes to Jesus and let him be your teacher. Finally, Jesus sends her away. He says to Mary, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He is saying to her, run, Mary, run. She goes and announces to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she tells them what Jesus told her to say to them. Mary crosses that finish line as the very first apostle a word which literally means one who is sent off. Although she had been struggling at mile 20, she flies past mile 26.2, carrying forward the message that she has seen the risen Lord. Easter is the anniversary of women on a mission, but its significance goes far beyond gender. Easter is an invitation to men and women to run together. Whatever our gender, we are people who are equally recognized by Jesus and equally sent off to be his people in the world. Wherever you are on your personal marathon, know that you do not run alone. 
Jesus sees you and recognizes you. In the middle of your pain and confusion, he calls you by name, and then he sends you off toward the finish line that lies before you. Mary is already on the run, and our challenge today is to follow her. Amen. Let us rise and join together in singing the Day of Resurrection, hymn number 233. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. Freely you have received, freely give. pray. You plant the seeds of grace, peace, love, and justice into our hearts, God, God of every morning. And with the tangible gifts we have as well, we can offer new hope and healing to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. What prayer, joys, or concerns do we have to share today? Yay, we're so glad to have you. Yes. Others? Okay. Um, just a quick word of wisdom about our little cups. I don't think I... Oh, here it is. Um, we're still using these um, with the pandemic, um, but if you if you play with this little tip here you will get a clear piece that pulls off and that will give you just the the wafer 
And then if you pull the whole piece, you'll get the juice. Yes, we've learned from experience. <laughs> she always knows I'm thinking about her when I get that little speech. <laughs> um, let us join together at the table. My friends, this is God's table, and he invites all those who trust and believe in Jesus Christ to take part in this joyful feast. It is the risen Lord who welcomes us to this meal. We come to feast on life and peace. Here, the gardener of life plants seeds of hope and wonders. We nourish them to release Here, the singer of lyrics of goodness teaches us new songs. Songs of how death has no more power over us. There was only chaos when there was no time, but you breathed the spirit, God of wonder, and watched waters flow and life emerge. You whispered through your word and clapped as mountains grew tall. Grass rippled across meadows, Cattle and other creatures roamed, and creation's beauty shone in wonder. The breath, the words, the created were brought forth on all, uh, for all made in your image. But temptation infected us with the virus of arrogance and rebellious natures. You would not give up on us, but sent those women and men who kept calling to us, encouraging us to turn away and come back to you. But the soft, seductive songs of sin knew our names all too well. You called your child's name, who immediately stepped forward to become one of us for our sakes. With all who hope in Christ, with all who continue to Christ question, we sing songs of praise to you. Holy, holy, holy are you, love which never ends. All creation sings these circuitatas. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Blessed is the one who has destroyed death. Christ is risen. Alleluia. In the chaotic times and place long ago, you listened to your people, God of all lives, and choosing to forget all our pasts, you sent your beloved child to become one of us, into shattered lives. He came rebuilding your people. Seeing those who wandered alone, he took us by the hand to lead us home. Noticing those quarantined by hate and fear, he went to their hearts to care for them. Realizing how many had been forgotten, he called us by name. When everyone forgot who we were, he remembered our names. When it seemed that the pandemic called death would have its way. He became your clinical trial, proving that resurrection love was the vaccine which would protect us from the very power of death itself. As we proclaim his death, as we hope in the promise of resurrection, as we join in glad alleluias on this day, we proclaim the faith which is a mystery. The one that thought dead lives. The one that thought to be lost finds us. The one we think we will never see will call us by name to bring us home. On this Easter morning, we pray you would pour out your spirit upon this bread that might give us strength, and on that cup overflowing with grace. Pour out your spirit, we pray as well, on your family gathered in these moments, people with great faith, yet who struggled not to lose it these past years. People who lived through loneliness and hungered for community. People who have, been, who have tried to be compassionate, yet who were wearied by worry and fear. As we eat this broken bread, transform us into those who will welcome the stranger. For we have known loneliness. Listen to the ignored, for we have lived in silence. Care for the forgotten, for we have struggled to be remembered. As we drink of the cup of grace, we pray you would nourish us so we may learn from those whose lives were not noticed, whose fears were not alleviated, whose needs were not met. 
And when that morning comes, when we finish this pilgrimage of life, being welcomed by the gardener of grace, along with our sisters and brothers of every time and place, we will sing of our love for you forever and ever, God in community, holy in one. Amen. And now we are bold to pray the prayer we were taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom of and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's rise and join together in singing hymn 268, Crown Him with Many Crowns. <laughs> 